I'm gonna drop a real hot take, and then spend the next 15 minutes or so explaining the context and nuance of it. Don't worry, I'm fully expecting to get clip chimped. Though, if you've looked at the title of this video, you already know where I'm going with this. But here it is. Here is the objective truth. Most people do not actually care about doxing. For those boomers in the audience who don't know, doxing, often incorrectly spelled with two X's, but properly only has one, refers to the practice of investigating and revealing someone's personal information. The word dox is a short form of the word documents, originally spelled D-O-C-S. Then it became D-O-X after it was run through 1990s era internet leet speak. And for the Zoomers in the audience who don't know, leet speak was a common way of typing annoyingly on the internet back in the 90s, where you would replace letters with numbers and add random X's and symbols and words. Before the internet as we know it today existed, in 1979 Usenet was established as the primary way for computers to communicate with each other people would post to forums called newsgroups, with each topic being called a thread. A lot of the old Usenet terminology carried over to the modern internet, along with the terminology of the old BBS system from the early 90s. For example, if you wanted to talk about math or physics, you'd go to sci.math or sci.physics. If you wanted to talk about atheism, it was talk.atheism. Usenet had each topic organized in trees, branches, and threads. What's important for our discussion today, though, is that even back then, doxing was a thing. Probably the most famous instance of early internet doxing was in 1999, when the owner of rec.skiing.alpine, Scott Abraham, was banned by court order from the newsgroup after he had doxed other people on there, as part of a broader no-contact order between two sides of a particularly nasty dispute. Honestly, reading this 1999 article about it on Wired.com is like going back in time. The point is, though, doxing has consistently been about taking an online argument just a little too far by revealing a target's personal information. The personal information in question can be an anonymous person's real name, or their workplace, their home address, information about their family, credit card info, social security numbers, anything that's about the actual person's real life. Doxing refers to the practice of digging up this private information and presenting it to the online world. But it also refers to the practice of digging up public information that isn't online. It's offline, but then putting it online. And it also refers to the practice of presenting information that is already online, but is relatively unknown to the presenter's audience. Basically, a very wide net is cast with the word doxing, and which definition is being used all depends on who's doing the doxing, who's levying the accusation of doxing, and what these people want you to think about the information. I remember specifically back during Gamergate, me and my friends had dug up some information about Zoe Quinn's offline life. We didn't spread this information around because it wasn't relevant to the ethics conversation, but we did use it to make certain professional connections that did become relevant for the ethics conversation down the road. And yet, a progressive-leaning person I used to know back then told me that I had doxed Zoe Quinn, even though what I had actually done was look up publicly available information in a phone book, and also keep it to myself. Neither of those facts mattered to that doxing accusation. The simple act of me looking, disconnected from anything else, was doxing to this person. Another example is Kraut. Yeah, he's a Poland ball YouTuber now, and a very good one. But back in the day, he was cancelled by the alt-right, a group of race-realist YouTubers and streamers that were ascendant back in 2017. He ended up leaving the internet after being harassed, and spent some time offline to regroup and relaunch his channel. One of the things people got angry at him for was an accusation of doxing. This Discord comment by Kraut made the rounds, where he excitedly exclaimed that he found Coach Redpill's real name. Kraut later confirmed that finding Coach Redpill's real name was actually important for journalistic reasons, as Coach Redpill was running a Ponzi scheme under that name. Which brings up an interesting question. Is it doxing if it's relevant to the public interest? Additionally, Kraut found Coach Redpill's real name because Coach Redpill had put it in, I think, his channel description at the time. If not that, it was some very public place in his channel. Is it doxing if the person being doxed put it out there themselves? The more we examine this idea, the more nebulous it becomes. Here's a few hypotheticals. Let's say that I put my real name in the description of every YouTube video. One of my haters then takes that name and plasters it all over their Twitter. Was I doxed in that situation? Now let's say, if you Google search that name, you found an old article about me where I won an award in high school, and then the person put my high school in my hometown along with that name. Was I doxxed then? What if, using that hometown, someone searched a publicly available land registry with my last name to determine where my family members lived in that town? Is it doxing then? Okay, what if somebody found on Google Maps a picture of my parents' license plate, then scoured Google Maps in my city for houses where my parents just so happened to be visiting me at the same time as the Google Maps car drove by, parked in the driveway? 
and then they somehow found my address that way. As ridiculously unlikely as that is, would it be doxing then? Keep in mind, this is all hypothetical. You're not actually finding me this way. But most people would look at this escalation and say no at the start and absolutely yes at the end. However, if you stand by the whole it's publicly available information defense, then none of this is doxing because it was all publicly available info. Nobody had to hack my computer or steal my wallet or something to find out where I lived or to get information on my family. They just had to follow the trail of breadcrumbs. This is why I personally don't think the publicly available info defense really holds up all that well. Even if the edges around what constitutes doxing are fuzzy, we all know what its purpose is. Intimidation. Unless you are specifically looking up information on a person for journalistic reasons, and you only use it in that narrow context, like with Coach Red Pill's Ponzi scheme, the act of compiling information on a person, even publicly available information, and putting it out there in one place where it's now more easily accessible than before, is a move meant to intimidate. It's saying, look, we know who you are in real life. You don't have the safety of being anonymous on the internet anymore. Even if they don't actually intend to show up at your house, it's meant to unnerve you by the possibility. Or alternatively, if the person trying to dox you has institutional power, then they want to wield that power against you in real life because you dare to talk back to them on the internet, which is why they're trying to de-anonymize you. In this case, it's more of a cancelling thing, but you can't be fired from your job, expelled from your school, debanked or deplatformed unless your info is out there, which is why doxing is an integral component of cancelling. However, as I said at the beginning of the video, most people don't actually give a shit about doxing. Remember that Kraut example? The alt-writers who came after him for it included Ethan Ralph and Nick Fuentes, who are notorious doxers and life ruiners. And pretty much everyone I investigated during Gamergate had no qualms with doxing or cancelling people when it served their interests. The cold hard truth is, the majority of people online view both doxing and cancelling as a valid tool to be used against their enemies, and only decry the practice when it's turned on them. Here's a recent example. It's not doxing, it's cancelling, but same basic idea. Chris Kindred of Sweet Baby Inc. wanted to destroy Cabrutus for the creation of the Sweet Baby Detector Steam page. Not just remove the group, but have Cabrutus lose his steam as well. He wanted him cancelled. But Chris's plan backfired. He got cancelled himself. And now the narrative is all about how evil cancelling is. How terrible it is the mob came after him, even though that's what he wanted to do to his enemies. Doxing follows the same rules. An accusation of doxing is, for the most part, a counter-virtue signal. The accuser gets to publicly exclaim how terrible a person the other guy is. He's a doxer. He puts people's info out there. He's evil and we're his victims. But when that same accuser gets the chance to dox somebody himself, of course he'll do it. Because he's good and his targets are evil and they need to be brought to light. Their misdeeds must be shown to the public. This is how most people think, regardless of their political persuasion. Left or right doesn't matter. An accusation of doxing isn't an appeal to a universal moral principle. It simply wears the cloak of that appeal for optics but most people are happy to violate that principle because when your enemies are evil, it's very easy to justify them not being under the protection of a universal principle. This especially applies to pedo hunter channels. It should be obvious, but just in case, pedo hunter YouTubers are people who catfish pedophiles online and then expose them for content. It's like the old Chris Hansen to catch a predator show from the 2000s, but instead of the support of the cops and a whole ass news station behind them, pedo hunters generally just make videos out of the pedophiles and then informally pass the information on to the cops. Oftentimes, the people that these channels expose who are actually guilty end up getting away with it because the legal requirement for proper evidence handling hasn't been followed, since these people are basically just vigilantes. Probably the most prolific channel of this type is Mama Max. He's got a channel with like 700,000 subs, and frankly, the deep lore on him is way too much for this video. If you want the scoop on this guy, Ched Logic has done a ton of content on him. And I do mean a ton. At one point, it was like all he streamed about for a fucking month. But the point is, because the targets of Mom Max and channels like him are evil, they can be doxxed with impunity. Yeah, I get it, they're accused of being pedophiles. But it's still just an accusation in the end. If there's no charges or anything, should we be destroying people's lives over YouTube accusations? I don't think so. Anyway, this is the basic logic of my argument. Most people do not actually give a shit about doxing, because they are fine to either do it themselves or cheer on it being done to the people they hate. The primary reason most people complain about doxing is because doing so makes them look good to their in-group. And if these various small examples didn't convince you, let's look at the big one from recently. I'm sure everyone knows who Stone Toss is, right? Stone Toss refers to both the comic and the guy who draws it. 
The Stone Tossed comic is made in the style of 2000s era webcomics, and is primarily posted to the website stonetoss.com, which is itself cut from the same cloth. But the content of the comics is primarily political from a right-wing point of view. Stone Tossed posted his first comic back in 2017, and he's been booming in popularity ever since, mainly because his comics are actually pretty funny. It's a common occurrence to see a left-winger complain, like, fuck, I actually found a Stone Tossed comic funny. He's so prolific that there's actually a Twitter account tracking people who complain about his popularity, and there's no shortage of them, especially because several of his comics, most notably the Acquired Tastes one, where boob lovers and ass lovers shake hands while rejecting the feet lovers, have become widespread memes on the internet beyond Stone Toss's own community or the online politics sphere in general. It's this widespread popularity that has caused many a lefty meltdown, because they can't tolerate somebody who opposes them getting big. Well, it turns out that Stone Toss was recently doxxed by two groups, the Anonymous Comrades Collective and the Late Night Anti-Fascists. They put his real name and face out there while decrying the content of his comics in the usual soy way. They also revealed that Stone Toss was the creator of the very similar comic Red Panels, which ran from 2015 to 2017. Considering how identical the art style and writing are, and the fact that Stone Toss appeared a few months after Red Panels ended, I don't think anyone doubted this was the case, but now it's confirmed. They then go into how they doxed him. They compared Stone Toss's voice when he was on Ethan Ralph's Killstream to Red Panels' voice when he spoke to Sargon. Then they went to the February 2021 Gab data leak to discover the email of the Red Panels Gab account, which contained his real name. This email led them to various crypto accounts, which were attached to other internet names. One of these internet names ended up being a prolific reposter of red panels and stone toss content around Reddit. This rabbit hole continues down through other accounts and posts, and how they line up with information that stone toss publicly made available, like his recent trip to Japan. To anybody who's done any sort of deep dive on a public figure, this sort of follow the evidence story probably feels and sounds familiar. But there is the million dollar question, is this doxing? Well, all of stone toss's supporters think so, and they have a very good argument. Stone Toss went to great lengths to keep his identity private. Yes, there was a breadcrumb trail leading back, if you were autistic enough to spend time following it. And yes, it's all publicly available information, which is the most common defense of this behavior. These Antifa goons didn't hack Gab, the info's been out there for years now. But nonetheless, it still feels like doxing, because we know what the intention is. Hell, they even say it. In this report, we aim to settle this debate and give the creator an opportunity to explain his views under his real identity. He created cartoons that reached everyone from casual online white nationalists to killers, politicians, and spoiled billionaires. The question is, how is that going to work for him now? This is a threat. It's saying, yeah, this is all publicly available info, but we put together the puzzle, and we are now presenting the assembled pieces to the world. We know who you are now, and we are threatening your livelihood. Of course, all of Stone Toss's detractors gave that same defense. It's publicly available info, it's not doxing! I mean, first off, they made fun of him for being an average-looking white guy, because of course they would. But beyond that, it's all just doxing apologia. Remember, it's progressives who are some of the most sensitive people about doxing. That was a big part of the Gamergate narrative, that the nasty gamers are coming for women in gaming, and doxing them. And that has been their consistent line ever since, for a decade now. Here's an example of what I mean. The trans activist account Esqueer posted Stone Toss's dox and then got banned for it. And look at the outcry from these anti-doxing progressives now. Esqueer has been suspended again, this time indefinitely for talking about publicly available information naming a Nazi. Twitter is going full fascist. I see that Esqueer isn't free speech enough for Elon today. Esqueer just had her account nuked while pointing out the double standard in posting publicly available information on Stone Toss. Again, it's publicly available. What makes this especially retarded is the trans angle. Yep, you know there had to be a fucking trans angle. It wouldn't be a discussion of hypocritical progressivism without one. There's a concept in the trans community called dead naming. A dead name is the birth name of somebody who's changed their name. This is most commonly used to refer to the names of trans people before they transitioned, but it also applies to anybody who's changed their name for any reason. The concept of dead naming really hit the mainstream when the actress Laverne Cox claimed that dead naming is an act of violence, and that the police misgendering and dead naming trans victims is an example of that cultural and structural violence. After this idea went mainstream, you had outlets publishing articles on it, social media platforms changing their terms of service to treat deadnaming like a slur under their dehumanizing speech policies, and as the culture shifted, you'd better believe trans activists use this as a bludgeon against their opponents. The tide is slowly receding on this like all other woke nonsense, but thinking back on it, deadnaming really is just a subsection of doxing. It is publicly presenting information about a person that may or may not be private, that may or may not have taken effort to dig up, with the intention of fucking with that person. 
If you were to head over to some trolling gay ops site and check out the docs of a trans person, their dead name would absolutely be included in it. Let's head back to those progressives, the ones who complained that a doxer got banned for posting the publicly available info. Each of them have taken a pretty strong anti-dead name stance, with the exact same logic that Stone Toss's defenders use. Guess what? Most dead names out there, they're also publicly available. Public records exist. This is why the doxing conversation is so fucking cancerous to me. Most of these people will talk about the evils of doxing out one side their mouth while praising it when it happens to their enemies out the other. There's no universal rule here, there's no common humanity, there's no consideration for other people as people. There is only using every tool at your disposal to the maximum possible extent because you are good and your enemies are evil. Which by the way leads to them doing the exact same thing to you. In my opinion we should tolerate none of this nonsense. It's good that Stone Toss's doxers got banned off of Twitter. And if the inverse happens, if a rightoid doxes a leftoid, they should be banned too. The only way we start to fix some of the mess that we're in is by insisting on a universal standard that applies to all people and then enforcing that standard, regardless of whether or not the radicals cry and whine about it. They can scream all they like. They did this to themselves and they deserve what happens to them. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're watching it on release, stick around because we are going to be streaming the new Nintendo slop game, Princess Peach Soy Time. Soy time, oh my god. Princess Peach Showtime. Yes, I am still a huge Nintendo cuck. Anyway, drop by and say hi. I will see you there, guys. I love you.